As rural Americans, we have a unique understanding of and connection to the land. Whether we ranch, farm, log, or simply recreate, what we do today determines our tomorrow. As stewards of the land, it's our duty to ensure that our children and grandchildren can enjoy the outdoors in a similar manner that was afforded us. Join the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and ensure the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Visit rmef.org today. Thanks to all of our great partners of Everything According to Flint and, of course, our friends at Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. You know, when we started this podcast project, we made a whiteboard with names on it of all of the people that we would eventually like to have on this show. Everybody from cowboys, people in the Western lifestyle, country music singers, athletes, friends, family. And you cannot do any kind of show about the Western lifestyle or anything involving a cowboy hat without the 26-time world champion and pro rodeo Hall of Famer, Trevor Brazil. So finally, Trevor answered a text message, returned a call, and scheduled a time slot out of his busy day to join us here on According to Flint. So enjoy the world champion, Trevor Brazil, after a few words, of course, from Pendleton Whiskey. Well, welcome to episode number 49, according to Flint. And as I mentioned in the intro, there are certain people that are on that whiteboard that you just got to have. If, if you have anything having to do with Western lifestyle, you got to have the world champion, Trevor Brazil. Hey, Trevor, good to see you. You just been going to soccer games and baseball games and wearing shorts with black socks or dressed just like umbrella, a cowboy. Dressed umbrella like drinks and beaches. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I'm glad you dressed no, up like, been- a, like a cowboy for our show. Appreciate that. Yeah, no, we've been super busy. This this retirement thing is I need a break from it a little bit. We're riding a bunch of horses, chasing kids around. It's uh retirement is a busy lifestyle. When what and maybe this is a dumb question, but I'm really good at dumb questions. Mm-hmm. When when's the last time you 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 use the R word and people a uh, retirement and people do about you? When's the last time you paid an entry fee for yourself to be in anything? When I paid an entry fee, I might have went to like a jackpot here and there locally. Uh, but like at at a professional event, the last time I paid an entry fee would have been 2020 for sure. Hmm. Does that mean you've been to other rodeos, but you got good friends that just pay your entry fees? Yeah, that too. That's no, what I would no, do. Well, I did go. To, I did go to Houston this year, but they did pay my fees. <laughs> Nobody pays fees at Houston, so that doesn't count. So that, yeah, that doesn't count. Do you do you pay fees at the NFR? No, nope. no, that's paid by. That's part of the Las Vegas thing, right? That's off all your fees all the other times of the year. All, all your fines and fees, <laughs> you, you're paid up. What's the biggest fine you ever got? So I'm talking uh, regular season or NFR because I don't think so as much, but the NFR used to be the hub of fines. That oh, was TJ Walter's only job was to find people. Biggest fine ever. A hundred percent at the finals, like uh, waving the flag in the grand entry. That got me, that progressively <laughs> doubled three times in a row before I really learned my lesson. <laughs> That's the dumbest fine. I remember that. Okay, so the the fines I always remember. <clears throat> Cody Ol and whoever else, they used to throw their pig and string in the crowd on the yeah. victory lap. That was a fine. That's fine, right? Yeah, I've had it, yeah. What is the definition of the fine? How is it worded? What's the violation? I mean, I, you know, I don't even know what the violation would be. Just not following their rules or riding, riding reckless is maybe it. I don't know. Okay, the waving the flag. It so for people who don't know, when you you always carried the Texas flag because you usually. I, how do they determine that biggest money? Just most money won from each individual state. And you were that guy. You were that guy. Good job. I had no idea. 
So you always, that was your thing. You'd always raise the flag. Who's interrupting you? It, it, somebody just walked That's by. That's my son. Yeah. What, he Tristan? doesn't know this. Is That's a, Tristan. This is a, he can say hi. Me. He can buy. I haven't seen him see, forever. See, let's Come here. He, say he's, hi, yeah. Yeah. He's taller than me now. He, no, that's I don't know if he can get down no, to that's that level. that's the wrong kid. Okay, now it's the kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, now uh, that he's on his knees, you kind of recognize it. Yeah, I see that. Hey, Tristan, can your dad? Does he swing a rope? Okay, still, or is he okay? What? He's got some shoulder problems with his <laughs> agent, so he'll he'll sidearm it every now. And I look then. like a wild cowboy. Do you, <laughs> do you uh, are you Tristan? You at the point now? It's like you roll your eyes dad odd or he gives you a tip and it's like oh these these junior high rodeo parent high school rodeo parents yeah. they drive me crazy i get a lot of that <laughs> no he's okay he's all right yeah does your does your mom know more sir does your mom know more yes yeah. she taught me everything i know <laughs> <laughs> i can't say he's wrong no no good to see you buddy i haven't seen you forever you're getting tall Taller, sure. taller than me, huh? That's yeah, because I got you beaten. Yeah, that's not a big deal. That's not yeah. a big deal. Uh, it, what's funny, I was saying before he walked through. By the way, that's what we do. If you have a dog, too, go ahead. Um, you used to always wave the flag, and I don't think people in the crowd at the NFR, I would watch and go, fine, fine. Oh, yeah. They have no idea. Waving the flag, that would be doing something we don't think you should be doing that. I think that's how it's worded. Basically. And well, and you know, now they put your number on the back of your NFR cut, which they used to not do. But so if you had your, your number on and it was 40 degrees out there, you couldn't ride with a jacket in the NFR because you had to have your number displayed, you know, so they'd know who to find. <laughs> so, but, Oh, so it counts. The NFR now, jacket counts. Yeah, if you have your NFR jacket on now that has the number on it, that'll work. I remember when uh, the first year I did the NFR, 1998, um, I got the contract and I wish I had a copy. I might somewhere. If you step out of your barrel, $250. If you, it listed these things that I could get fined for. Cause it, what you didn't really get to do your job. You just, it was the honor of doing it. The first night there, when they introduced me, I was so scared to get in fines. I did a find. I didn't even tip my hat because I thought that might have irony right there. What do you call your show in Vegas? Out outside the barrel. There you go. That's 250. Right off the bat. <laughs> stepped on the dirt. Stepped on the dirt. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, that was my first NFR also, 98 at Vegas. No kidding. Mm -hmm. uh, all the greats. All the, all yeah, the legendary you guys, you and me. I didn't realize that. Oh, we're, you're, you would have been, how old were you at your first NFR? I made the steer open finals in 97 and in 98, I would have been 20. Hmm. Yeah. I was a little older than that. You know what I want? Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to make the NFR before, before I was 30. And in 98, December of 98, I was 30. Yeah, I was 30. So I, I wanted to be 29. So I almost, almost. Oops. Hey, um, you, uh, as you sit home this weekend, we're coming off the 4th of July. I went and watched my girls at a couple of rodeos just in Montana. They each won some money roping. One breakaway roping, one team roping. Um, and they do, they did, each of them did like three rodeos around Montana. And mm -hmm. it, you sit in Montana and I think that's what people they think they're all within three hours of each other and you just kind of ease around. Is there a part of you that you watch these guys beating it down the road and they haven't slept in six days? Is there any part of you that craves that, that rush a little bit, or is that something that you just every, you woke up on the morning of the third and said, hell with that. No. Uh, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you know, I talked to Patrick because he's still rodeo and my team rodeo partner for the last 10 years. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, you know, trying to make a 13 hour trip in 12 hours. That's just what we do. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it is. I said, well, where are you going, Cody, to St. Paul? And he's like, yep. And so it's just part of it. But I, I would even when I would 
not be rodeoing full time. I was just steer up in the last couple of years. I would just make sure I showed up within five minutes of when it started so I could practice my fire drill saddling and everything. <laughs> well, you just just drive in really fast yes, like you would. For, I just had a discussion with somebody, Jesse Davis, bareback rider, and we were talking. Uh, he was sorting the timed event cattle behind the timed event shoots uh, in Shoto, Montana at the amateur rodeo. Jesse Davis, well, he made the NFR like 10 times. So oh, yeah. that was his deal. We were having the discussion. Remember the rough stock guys would go between Malala and St. Paul? Oh, yeah. well, Malala would start with bronc riding or however they, they would did. stagger their events. Yeah. Yeah. How they work with each other. Um, how do we not, I, I, I took my daughter to a couple last year and we went Bell Foosh up to Kildeer back to Billings. I'm miserable for like three days. It can't be good physically or mentally. Did it, did you notice for a couple of weeks after that eight, nine days during the fourth, were you not on top of your game? Did it take you a while? It just depends how your fourth went. Winning heals you mentally and physically. Losing doesn't. You know, you, you feel good. But like, like what you brought up, the Molala, St. Paul, it wasn't just in the rough stock. Um, I always had to break it to my team roping partner because when we were planning their 4th of July run, we're like, well, you can work St. Paul and Malala the same night because they stagger the events. And I was like, you mean, so if we team rope at one, we can make it to the other one because they'll have the calf roping going on or something. I said, you forget, I've got to do it all anyway. So I could only go to one a night anyway. So those staggering rules didn't really help a multi-event cowboy. Yeah. Um, Cody Lambert on this, we had him on here and he was talking about when he and I can't remember who he was traveling with at that time, but they, they got a driver because they had it figured um, how much better they were. The, the amount they spent on a driver, they made up for in feeling better and how much they won. You, you had a drive. How often did you have a driver? When, did you take advantage of that over the fourth? Did you at all? What, what was your, well, I, I, I had a driver, a big part of it because anytime that I would fly off, I, I, you know, different from rough stock. I mean, you have to have somebody taking care of your horses and stuff. And it just made it so much more seamless to have somebody, you knew where they were, you knew they were taken care of. You take them right over here after you drop me off the airport, I'll meet you here. Uh, I know my horses were taken care of. I didn't have to leave them with different people all the time. Because you know how when you get aged rodeo horses, they have these supplements for this one and this, you know, Equiox here, this supplement here. It's just too much. Never gets done right without without the right person. <clears throat> Who is your guy? Who is your go-to driver? Anybody I know? Or did I maybe I did know your driver? I'm sure I'm sure you've known several through the years because <clears throat> they were instrumental in in a lot of my success. I mean, I've had a lot of good guys that work for me, but uh, they're one on the top of the thank you list every year because it did keep me, I feel like feeling better, you know, that peace of mind, less stress. Uh, it just, it was a game changer for me also. Was your driver Patrick Smith? Was he? Smith, was, he, was he likes he, to say he was, but you have to physically touch the wheel in order to be classified as a driver. <laughs> I should have introduced you as half of the now retired comedy duo of Trevor, yeah. Trevor Brazil and Patrick Smith. I do. I got to kick somebody, uh, one of his, you know, they've been catching a few because he's rodeo with a bunch of kids now and uh, they took over his Facebook because that's the only social media he has, I think. And uh, they put a picture of him sleeping and they said, yes, on the 4th of July, you got to get a full 15 hours daily. <laughs> and, and so I was just thinking to myself, I haven't got the videos, but I know they must be winning right now or they wouldn't be poking the bear like that. Yeah. Um, that I, I was thinking of you two when, uh, you know, all through the years that I've hosted the buckle ceremonies at South Point. And even doing a show like this and my show in Vegas, you pick, you have your rotation of people, cowboys. I always did. Cause I know who's good, who can complete a full sentence without saying the F word or whatever, you know? 
And Randy Corley and I did them at that time. And when you and Patrick would win, Corley always, if I was at the rodeo, Corley knew where I sat up over his left shoulder with Michael gone. And he'd look up and give me the thumbs up because you guys were so savvy on stage. Um, the, it, more and more rodeos on TV and more exposure. It's got to help guys with media or teach them the media thing is a very valuable component in all this, isn't it? Oh, it's huge. <clears throat> I mean, it's, if you can make, you know, a friend of the media and it's not hard, it's just being there when they call, you know, mm-hmm. being available, uh, letting them know that they can count on you for, for public engagements and stuff like that. That goes so far with sponsors. And <clears throat> like you said, more so now because, you can give them so much more airtime. And I, what I feel like someone will say, well, it may not be an ABC or NBC, but it's, it's a target audience for any company in the Western industry for sure. And I think, I think they've done a big thing for rodeo, just putting them on a, you know, consistently that's, that's been huge. And I think it's gave, gave these guys a, a better opportunity, which is what, all these transitions are about is just making, making it to where every sport has more opportunities and it's long time for ours to have that same one. I've, I've for a long time, people say we got to fix rodeo. We got to change rodeo. I think basically, I think fans need to meet Cowboys in a way that I've always tried to do on my show in Vegas. Let's meet them in a different way besides, Hey, tell us about your run. Well, I got a really good start, and uh, I handled that steer, and Patrick just scooped him up. Okay, back to you, Jeff. That's really all we used to get to meet people. Um, is that the, to me, that would be the one thing that rodeo could improve on is, and is now, is just meeting guys in a different light. Don't you think? Well, yeah, and, and I think it's easier now because when you're on TV, when you have a microphone in your face more than – you know, five or six times a year, the people that are doing the interviews realize that the the public's already heard this story. They've already seen this deal. And so I just think as a whole, the industry gets more exposure and people are just like you say, more savvy of what got asked last week to this guy and, or this happened here. Let's talk about we saw this happen last week. How is that different from what we're seeing now? I mean, it just ties it all together instead of just one run out on an island in the middle of, we'll see you next year. You know, you know, the biggest thing I see, I don't watch a lot of rodeos on Cowboy Channel. First of all, I don't have Cowboy Channel. And I'm poor. I don't have Cowboy okay. Channel. But one thing I notice is now that there's so many rodeos on TV, when a guy gets on a roll and they start featuring him every week because we're building stars, building stars. Mm-hmm. We get pushed back from our fans about building stars. It, I'm going to give you an example. Rocker Steiner. Rocker's winning, and he's winning because he's the best. He's one of the best ones. All of a sudden, oh. fans are looking, oh, geez. Uh, they're gifting that kid again, trying to sell the product. Like, Damn it. Um, it. We we push for things in rodeo, and when we accomplish those things, then we get pushed back. I guess it happens in everything, but I sure it does. feel it. I mean, yeah, you see it at a football game. Mm-hmm. I mean, any any of that stuff. I mean, anytime that you are in front of fans more, they get to express their opinions more. And it is. Nobody's – it's funny how that people like to see people do good until they do too good, and it's like, let's put – let's – Push him back just a little bit. We've had enough of him, you know. I've heard that a time or two. <laughs> we all wear cowboy hats. We're all supposed to be really nice and pat each other on the back and get along. Yeah. And you calf ropers, you all you all are best friends, right? I mean, yeah. that's it. calf ropers, yeah. barrel racers, you all go to no, dinner at night. And... No, neither one of us are catty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why I thought of you that this speaking, it, it kind of comes from that, uh, what we were talking about with media, but... I get a little frustrated sometimes. I've had people say to me, you know, man, you've had opportunities put in front of you. You've had, oh, lucky you. You were lucky because this, this, this. 
when you work your ass off to create opportunities and then when the opportunities come along, you've been given those opportunities. And I don't know why that makes me think of you, but I think when you're successful for a very long time, people forget what you had to do to create for yourself those chances. I think there's well, not, forgotten. It's not only what you have to do, but then when you get a few of those opportunities, it's about not uh, forgetting what made you that lucky in, in the beginning too. And that's the hard thing is keeping on putting yourself back out there and work hard enough to get lucky again. Yeah. It's uh, what, what's the saying about luck? It's uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Well, that's for damn sure. That's right. You know, um, everybody, some people come from nothing and create every opportunity, but I do, um, I gained some respect one. I was doing an interview with tough Cooper and we were talking about chances and um, doing real well. And he said, you know what? I have a lot of people compliment me on how good I am in roping. And he said, I should be good. I've had every opportunity to swing a rope my entire life. I'm supposed to be good. If I wasn't a good roper, I really screwed this up. And I thought that was probably the most, well, for one, it was the most insightful thing I've ever heard Tuff say. <laughs> but oh, yeah. I thought no, that was, no. I thought it that is. was it's pretty good. a good perspective because he has had those things, you know, coming from Super Looper. I mean, how many guys has he helped throughout, you know, his career and after his career and just being exposed to him and Stran, uh, me as a brother-in-law and Clint and Cliff both going head-to-head -head with him in the practice pen. I mean, that's what we always said, iron sharpens iron. And I feel like we were really fortunate in that aspect to have each other just to a lot of people only could measure how hard they've been working by the time they went out on the 4th of July to see how they measured up. I mean, we had a pretty good idea because we had some of the best ropers in the world at any one time roping with us all the time. Um, you, of course, if you excel at a sport, m me with my job, you, um, with what you do, but you really, you got to have a passion. It's easy to say, you got to have a passion. You got to love it. Um, I did an episode here with Jackie Crawford and she's funny. She ropes, she ropes pretty well too. Yeah, but she yeah. told, I don't even know how we led into this story, but she told this story about being passionate about what you do and really committed. And she told a story about going and roping at your house all day long. And she said, I kept waiting for Trevor to be kind of miserable because we had to practice. It was hot. We were practicing all day and I kept waiting for Trevor to get grouchy. She said it was the funnest day she ever had. And it always because Trevor Brazil doesn't just like winning and roping. He loves the whole process. And it taught her on that day that you got to love not just the rodeos and not just the winning, but the process it takes to get there. Comp great compliment to you. No, it is. And I like to say, she has been around, you know, Larry D. She learned more from her than she ever learned over here, I can promise you. But uh, I've always enjoyed having her because <clears throat> if, you, if she asked you a question, it was easy to answer because you weren't wasting your time because she was going to try to implement immediately, no matter if it took changing a lifestyle or whatever it, it took. She wanted it bad enough that she was going to pay the price, no matter how hard it was. And it's fun, you know, sewing into those kind of people. And it is, and I, you say it's a passion and you say how much you love it until like, say I retired and don't really, I always thought I was, must be the competition. It must be the winning. And until I was home and they would enter me in a rodeo and I'd be like, man, uh, I don't really want to go to the rodeo, but they're like, well, you've been roping every day. And I was just like, I enjoy roping, but I've done the competition part of it. And I just, I've already done that part of it. And I love the horses. I love roping. And to me, that, that is my new that was my new thing is well, I go to a lot of the rope horse fraternities and we're raising some of our own now and just watching them go through that process and keeps me here at home. Tristan's roping a lot. You saw him earlier. 
um, and it keeps me here for my girls' sports, whatever they're into at the time. Uh, it's basketball now, so it's just great. I get to do my my passion till about lunch, and then on to the next thing, whatever they've got going. What tell us about your? Uh, I actually made a note of. You know, I see your name on some great horses out there. You're you're raising, you're training, selling horses. Good business. What I know I've talked to different people who are very passionate. You know, of course you're passionate about the horse in general, but the horse business. Give us a little background of what you're accomplishing, what you're raising and stuff like that. My passion was raising and training and the selling is just a byproduct because I've tried keeping and they multiply like rabbits around here. You know, when you, <laughs> especially when you start getting into the breeding game, man, every, just because every cute baby, you know, hits the ground, it's there's the ones that did it two years ago are ready to start getting rode. And then you got twos, threes, fours. I mean, they just keep coming. And so if you don't, uh, let some of the ones go that are, you know, have been through the program and that are ready to go on to the next level. They'll just stack up around here like cordwood and be no good for anyone. Um, but since then we, uh, we kind of reverse engineered our horse program. We started, uh, with a cult that we really liked and we were actually, I'd like to sound really smart, but we were contacted by the owner of the stallion and said, we see you have one of our offspring. We're wondering if you would be interested in buying a horse. And I was just like, man, no, we're not in the breeding game at all. And they wanted you to buy the stud. Yeah. Is that what they, oh, gotcha. Yeah. And uh, show me the buckles. This is how, how this came to be. Uh, that's our studs name. And she said, well, if you ever change your mind or whatever, uh, go look him up. She said, have you ever seen him? I said, no, I've never seen him. And so I went and searched, show me the buckles. And I probably called her back not very long after that. I said, what are you thinking? I kind of like him. <laughs> and so that's a short version. And it's been, it's been awesome. We love riding his colts. Uh, they cross well on a lot of stuff and we're breeding them for everything now. What was he when you went on when you went and watched? What was he? What was he doing? What he was a rainer, okay. but like say we, he was shown. I think he'd never won less than second at any outing. It was just a, it was just a. He was a freak athlete. Uh, his Colts were doing great for us in the roping, and they're still doing great. And we're just we're just loving the process because it's something that when you can kind of catch lightning in a bottle type thing where you can create more of it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Horses, uh, horses are such a big deal. And I've been through it with my girls are good hands and they ride. We've tried to keep them riding good horses, but a good horse doesn't do you any good if there's not horsemanship there. And the, the great ones I talked to. Ride sure. it, yeah. I talk to guys like you. I know, um, you know, my girls went to a lot of, they've worked with Joe Beaver a lot. Not that, and Joe emphasizes how they ride their horse. I've gone to some uh, college rodeos, even high school rodeos. Horsemanship is frustrating. Like to me, the biggest mistake, if you were to go, you know, around parents and their kids, I don't think there's, am I, am I on that? They don't spend enough time on, you, you got to ride the damn horse first. I see oh, that yeah. lacking a little bit. You, am I, I'm not completely done. No, there, but. no. And I, I think the more they're around the sport and really dive into it, that, that'll be the people that make it the longest, make it more successful, make it more of a business because it's like when you buy a new car and you maintain it and keep low miles and keep the oil changed and like, you just take care of those things, which you're making your living on. And if nothing else, they're the same, if not better, by the time you're done with them, then you don't lose money. You know, so, so all of a sudden this horse buying process isn't so miserable because you have the tools yourself 
to make to either retain that value or create a higher value just by being a better hand. Um, God, you know, you watch kids and uh, whether people call my girls barrel racers. How's your barrel racers? My girls are cowgirls, damn it. You know, That's not right. now. There's not, a difference. I mean, not that they do. I always say barrel racing is one of the events they do, especially college rodeo. You know, they do. I got a four eventer and a three eventer. You, you, uh, you didn't have to do, or did you go to a year or two of college? Did I miss that? I did. Where'd you go? I, did. I went to Vernon for two years and then I went to West Texas A&M my third year. Okay. Yeah. How'd it go? My third and final year. The third with your your third year master. I made the finals. Year. I made the finals that year, and uh, I remember having the talk with my math professor, which was also my rodeo coach. And he's <laughs> like, "It's just like this is what we all wanted to do, you know. And you have this opportunity, and school will be here, you know. Um, you're because I had I had done the classes beforehand. I was a junior." I just had, you know, that last year and I'd always told my mom, though, if I don't make the finals, I'll go back. And, uh, I was lucky enough to, that was what made me work so hard. I just kept making the finals. I didn't have to go back to school, but, uh, <laughs> so wait, I got to get this straight. You went to three years of college mm-hmm. and you made the college finals once. No, no. Or you no, made, made it, it the all- other, you made it all three. So where, where was it? When, so 90. So, uh, oh. I went, I went when it was at Bozeman, Bozeman and then Rapid City and Rapid City. There was like 36 people there. Do you remember? I was there. Yeah. I, I wasn't compete. I was, yeah, I did it in Bozeman and then moved to Rapid City. Now it's, it's been in Casper for, it's wonderful by the way. I don't know if you've been, but it's I haven't been to one of my favorite rodeos I go to my, I just was there. Um, and the, I think the college rodeo experience is valuable. Um, 100%. I think there's a pressure, kind of a weird time frame pressure. Everybody gets 10 rodeos. I think it's real valuable in shaping what you can be. I think it's more than just the rodeo part of it. Yeah. I mean, it's just growing up. It's uh, for me, it was just mature and physically. I got to rope more calves when I was in college because I had. John Mahoney was the best rodeo coach you could ever ask for. And so well, my two years at Vernon, I wrote more calves than I ever did at home. And it was, it was crucial to me developing. And uh, because at 18 out of high school, I had zero chance, especially in the tie down roping coming from high school rodeo, going straight out to the wolves. There's no way college did a lot for me right there. I see it. Call it college rodeo has become like a lot of rodeos. There are a select few. When you get down to that top 12 in the short round, that bareback ride and bronc ride, it's really good. But as far as sheer numbers, I really enjoy watching the calf rope and the bulldog. And because I think there are physically a lot of those guys, timed event wise, they know, they do know how valuable that is, whether it's physically, um, whatever the case may be. There's just so many opportunities like, uh, yeah, the numbers of bull riders is down because if you're 18 years old, you can go anywhere and make money ri- or attempt to make money riding bulls. It creates the illusion that you can make money. But timed event guys, shoot, I went Kincaid Henry and um, Casey Murphy's kid, Macon Murphy, and you know those bulldoggers that are there. There are some. It's freaking good. It's yeah, really no, good. The two, the two tight end ropers you name, they're going to be really successful and they're those guys can can do every aspect of it. Looks good. Yeah, the Murphy kid. You know why he's good? Because his dad. Because his dad's from Montana. That's right. I knew that too. I, <laughs> I uh, went to a lot of open rodeos uh, with and around his dad. Uh, I've known. I knew him long before I knew Mike. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in twenty twenty one, the Montana State University women were the national champions. Just I'd throw that out there. I knew two. I know two of the four team members. As a matter of fact, yeah. as a matter of fact, it's, did you raise them? It's gen. No, I didn't raise them, but I'm their father. <laughs> <laughs> I'm their uh, oh. biological father. Yeah, my yeah. two girls. That was fun. Anyway, um, 
Do you, on a, on any day, is your place kind of family? Do you have a lot of people come? Like we were talking about Jackie Crawford came real with you. Is your place a destination or do you guys kind of just keep to your own deal? What's, what's a typical week at your place? People in and out of there? It's pretty busy. It's pretty busy. Um, and the thing is, you know, sometimes when someone needs to come by or the scheduling is the only hard part. Once it's, once somebody's here, it's easy because I enjoy helping, but scheduling is a nightmare. But uh, I love when people like that come over and like really want to work something out and get better. Um, during our guys, guys are kind of up North a little about, I used to always say about the first of August, pretty much everybody, it gets really hot down there. Everybody was up in the Northwest. I know I always, from about the second week of August through September, all those rodeos were up in the Northwest. People, does Texas thin out a little bit because it's so dang hot? I mean, yeah, that's a really good time to be in the Northwest, Canada, <laughs> all of that stuff. But I mean, don't kid yourself. It gets really hot in Hermiston, Oregon. Too. Holy crap. Yeah, I was, as I said that, because Hermiston was always like the 10th of August. You know, it's kind of that second week. Which one's that? This is Swayze. This is my youngest That's one. Swayze. We don't really know each other, Swayze. No. She was little. That, that, that old guy right there used to be. Uh, oh, oh, the old guy used to be. Oh, yeah. I used to babysit. You just make sure your dad was okay. Yeah. Bye, buddy. Jeez, you got uh, holy cow! I'm telling you, I'm um, telling you that one. That one, uh, okay, man, is really spoiled because there's six years difference between her and my middle girl style, and so Tress and Style are real close, and then she's six years behind them. So they're either torturing her or spoiling her. There's no in between. So she's she's a handful. I, I'm a dad of girls. You're the one spoiling her. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, hey, Hermiston, Oregon. Back to that. Yeah. Uh, about the 10th of August, I remember being there. Uh, I remember we were parked. Katie was pregnant, so it would have been 98-ish. It was 108 degrees. The power wasn't enough to run the air conditioner on the trailer. And I, I, think, I think somewhere around Canby or Hermiston is where somebody realized that that one AC is not enough for a living quarter trailer that's <laughs> over 10 feet long. Oh my gosh. I remember one, one, uh, one day there in Hermiston, it was like 106 during the day. And right when the rodeo was about to start, this cold front moved in. And this is hard to believe in Hermiston too. The wind came up really strong yeah. and the temperature dropped to like 60 degrees and they sold out of every shirt, sweatshirt, coat, for the Farm City Pro Rodeo. It, oh, yeah. But remember they had the, the truck full of watermelons back in the parking lot and you could just go load up and hit the road? That's right. Walshy Farms, I think. Yeah, that's, just, that's the stuff I remember. Because, <laughs> see, you would come in for 24 hours or t three hours. I stay all weekend. I experience the whole thing. That's, that's a good point. We have a completely different yes. view of rodeo because you would go and stay at one place and everybody was asking me about the fourth of july rodeos and i was like man i you're talking about a week to where if i'm there 12 hours i was there a long time that's because i had to sleep there yeah you know or for an early morning slack or that's that would be the max there was a lot of places we hit that we weren't there three or four hours i don't i don't know that people really understand it i i was talking to my page my younger daughter she was talking about it the other day and said, you know, dad, we, I, we've never gone hard like that. She said, I'm learning that, you know, these guys and gals, they'll come in for two hours and do their event beyond to the next one. You know, they kind of yeah. hit that middle. They used to go with me, which believe it or not, they don't really remember of a lot of the rodeos we went to, but the public doesn't, Bob Tallman used to have a saying, and I can't say it on here. It was all pool parties and something else. But yeah. although we are passionate about what we do and love our job, it isn't always what it's, it's not all starched clothes. And oh, no. 
full hookups and stuff. No, I think that's what makes those those days in Vegas and the times, you know, that you the thing I looked forward to was after the fourth of July, you could actually cool your jets at Calgary, you know, actually stop somewhere for four days. I mean, that seemed like an eternity, you know, to be able to sit in Calgary for your whole pool. Yeah. I was there for all 10. See? Yeah. But it was well, you're right though. I remember going over, remember the tent where they'd serve lunch. Oh, yeah. And then uh, the free lunch, they had terrible pizza in Canada. But um, they'd serve lunch and then beer after. And I'd always go, I hit lunch and the tent, the sponsor tent after, because guys like you, that was the one place that you didn't have to go. I would stand there. I remember leaning there talking to Trevor Knowles um, and, and Blake because for some reason I remember them. And I always hung around the Bulldoggers in case stuff went down. I understand, you know, yeah, smart move. but it is, I don't think people realize that uh, that was the place I caught up with everybody too, was relaxing. Yeah. Because there's those opportunities just didn't exist anywhere else. Unless you were talking about taking a rental car back to the airport for somebody or everything was logistics the week before there was no small talk about anything else. It was logistics and what you were riding, what you're drawing, what's the cattle like, is it raining over here? You know, mm-hmm. Uh, we talk about people showing up at your house. Do you, because I don't see it, because some people, you know, Joe B, he travels around, does school after school clinics. Have you gravitated towards the clinic thing that you don't really, do you? I don't really. No, I, I, I'm pretty much here. Um, I don't really do private lessons unless they're through charity. Um, that's like say those are hard enough to keep up with and keep scheduled and just keeping up with the madhouse. Is, is that a, is that a family commitment or is that a conscious decision by you? Does it not open a can of worms you don't want opened? Would you just want to keep it there? Um, it's just like, say with the horse program, I would have to back that off a lot to be able to go and do a clinic or, to do lessons and stuff, I would have to like do some restructuring for sure to, to not have one suffer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess I can't, I can't do them fully and I can't do them the way I'd want to do. So I don't just do it. Yeah. I get that. Um, the, uh, I get asked things, Hey, what's the coolest moment in the arena? All these annoying questions you get asked. With all due respect to everybody who's asked those questions. Everybody that asks annoying questions. Yeah, with all due respect. Sorry, but so there are such a thing. Through all those 26 or 104 world titles that you have, there are certain years and different places that stand out to me that mean the most and why it meant a lot. Is there a year or a title uh, an event title, an all-around a calf rope and team rope and steer rope and title that when you think back, you go, man, remember that one, or you'll talk about it with someone that means more than the rest of them. Um, I have a few that, that just stand out as like those moments that I like really remember a lot of it. Uh, my first all-around championship and my last all-around championship came down to the 10th round and tie down. I had to win second or better both times. Um, so I started it and ended it like that. And then the triple crown years were really cool just because like I was always an all-around guy and that was obviously the most important thing to me, but I also wanted to be com- you know, a contender in the, uh, individual events also. And I knew that if I was good enough at those, the all around would take care of itself. And so the years that the 07, a triple crown year, I won the steer open and the tie down rope and, and the all around And 2010, when I won the calf rope and the team rope in the same year, that was probably the most special one for me, as far as the triple crowns went. And ironically enough, 07, and 10 were when style and Tristan were born. And then it's not coincidence. Oppor- that's not coincidence. I'm a, I had an opportunity that. 
to do it in 2015 when Chetta was pregnant with that little one that was just in here. And I had to be nine, seven. I'd already, uh, they'd already called the all around. I'd won the steer open and I had to be nine, seven on my last calf, which shouldn't have been a problem. The calf was fine. Uh, and I figurated a tail and didn't get it done. That was, that was one that stung for a long time because that was, I would have had it. The only triple crowns I would have ever had was the year that my kids were born. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, to me, your 2010, where it was at the NFR, because for people who don't know the steer, the steer roping is held mm -hmm. not during the NFR and it's got its own NFR. So yeah, you're, your triple crown calf rope and team roping all around. When I think of your career, to me, that's the one that I go, God, that, okay, now he's pretty good. Uh, yeah. 2010, all these years. Look at that guy figuring it out. Nice yeah. work. Nice work. Um, what about uh, this Stetson Wright? He's pretty good cowboy. Huh? How about that, that kid? Fun to, fun to watch. He, uh, there's some triple crowns in his future. It doesn't seem to have a weakness. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that, you know, he keeps getting stronger and I really think, and he said it a few times that the, he just didn't feel like he was a saddle bronc rider, you know, and then now it, it's just it gets better every year and it's awesome. And he's, he's definitely going to be the next guy that, that pulls off something like the triple crown or, be a quadruple crown if he starts riding bareback horses because I don't have any doubt that he couldn't do that too. <laughs> those man, those turds, those Wright brothers, and there were they were all. I know uh, Jake, the one uncle was a bull rider. They've all ridden bulls. They can do all that stuff. They played football yeah. real good. They're fast and played football. Man, that makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> Which part? Just the, the, just the whole of thing. It? Just the whole thing. Yeah. But uh, Stetson, that's that rough stock deal though. That's a, it, it's a little different. That's kind of a war of attrition there. How long people say he'll win however many he can. No, his body will dictate how much. Did your body start to dictate you a little bit? You you were fairly good through your career, weren't you, health wise? Oh seven, I started having like uh, this trouble in my back and stuff, but it was uh, relatively healthy my whole year. You know, I've had a, some collarbones or ankle surgeries, but like MCL maybe, but I mean, like no, nothing that I had to be sidelined for a full, you know, that keep me out of uh, the NFR, like yeah. to where it was a season ending deal. I was really, really blessed in that department. I, I feel like I've been blessed till about the last year. This looks, tell you all, what, this looks all in one piece, man. <laughs> man, I'm telling you. Well, I didn't realize at the time, you don't know what you don't know, but when I did quit uh, tie-down roping day in, day out, my body felt so much better. You know, I guess you just don't realize, you know, just the the impact, you know, at the end of the rope every day from practicing and, I mean, at the rodeos, everything, you know, my low back would just feel like it took a beating and I feel healthier now as far as my back goes than I ever did the last, you know, 10 years I rodeo. Time to go again. Woo. Yeah. Breaking yeah. news. I, Breaking rem news. I remember that. <laughs> I, it's still fresh enough. I remember the way it felt before. <laughs> yeah. Give it a few years. They, they all do that. They, Ooh, man, I feel good. There was a bull rider <laughs> recently, PBR bull rider and on Facebook. I'm coming back. I'm not going to say who was. I think he was. Anyway, all of a sudden, ooh, you know what? I'm got to have a quick surgery. Got to have a quick surgery. I guess I wasn't quite ready. Yeah. yeah, let me tell you what else is tough on knees and ankles is uh, dancing in the dirt for years. Dancing in the dirt. You know that. You know. You know your kids do. Yeah, I do that a lot. Yeah, I know. Uh, I did this the other day. I was talking to Dusty Tuckness, the bullfighter, on a little show, and with, they were talking about all the rodeos coming up over the fourth and he had been to Reno and then he was in Cody and 
I made him, if I, okay, I'm a, a kind of a rodeo person, but don't know a lot. And I say, Trevor, um, listen, we want to go to three rodeos this year that really encompass, you know, a variation or what rodeos are, you know, in the summer. If I was that person and said, what three rodeos would you suggest would give us the greatest experience? Yes, you're in a different boat where you, you're in and out, but there are some that you know. Which three would you tell people to go to? Oh, man. <laughs> Put well, you have to go to Pendleton. That's the common one. Everybody says yeah. that one. Yeah. That's, that's, my, that's one of my favorites by far. Um, and then you got to go to Cheyenne just because of the that's tradition. Best. Even though they've, I've heard they've changed the tradition since then. A little bit, a um, little bit. Now, those two are pretty common. It's that third because what I end up is given a third one and then name maybe four and five. I, no. My my third and fourth would probably be between like a, a winter rodeo just for a little flavor of that sort, like a Houston or... An indoor where you get... Yeah. The, where you, it's, a, then, it's an arena show. But then I'm show. torn because then you've got Salinas on the West Coast and it's so unique and it's yeah. it's style too. So it is. Those those two, If you, it's easy to get my top two. And then from there, man, there's a lot of lot of right there on that level. I th- I'll tell you, check me if I'm wrong. So I always pick Pendleton. I re- I'll never forget before I went. Uh, I don't Maybe you know. Do you know Corey Mitty? He's a Montana yep. team rope. He said, Pendleton's the greatest rodeo in the world. And I'm like, how can, how is that possible? The rodeo's a rodeo. He had a, he had a heel horse named Dashboard that fit it really good. <laughs> I'll tell him that. I'll tell yeah. him that you remembered that. I will. Yeah. Um, and he kept saying, you don't understand. And now I catch myself telling people, you don't understand. Mm-hmm. So i never forget when I went there, I said, oh, now I understand. Well, I'm not sure I fully understand. <laughs> yeah. So you got to pick Pendleton and that uniqueness. And Cheyenne has that uniqueness. So the one I pick kind of as my third one is one that I think is a class act, beautiful facility, more of just a two hour and 20 minute rodeo, bam, bam, traditional, but really bright lights, high energy. And that's Reno. I like Reno. Good rodeo. And it's just really iconic for like, for, for us within the industry. For sure, it's iconic just because of what it means. It means like it's time to go again. Like we've been, you know, the winter and spring, and then now it's it's summertime when Reno hits. You know, that's more more of what it means for the season as much as anything. Yeah. But if you take if you take Pendleton and Cheyenne, and then tell people this is how you qualify for this other rodeo in Las Vegas, and then you show up in Las Vegas, and you're like. That was nothing like what we just went to. Right, yeah. And and I exclude Las Vegas because everybody yeah. should go there. But then I name those, and then I start to go, man, I sure like Ellensburg and Red Bluff's cool. Clovis, man, that's cool. Sisters, Oregon. I always I loved Sisters, Oregon. It was great. So I got a lot of them. Sisters is beautiful. Nampa is always a great rodeo. Yeah, I never did Nampa. I did Caldwell, but I never did Nampa. And I yeah. never went to same Salinas. Crowd, same crowd, same crowd, just indoors. One's outside, one's inside. And yeah. I never went to Salinas. I never, I yeah. did the other ones, but there, we could reminisce all day. All right, uh, one thing also that I've done on here is, and I did it on my show, caught myself doing it at my show at the PBR final. You're just walking around on a day like this. You've been out riding, sweaty. I know you stink. You, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, what buckle you do know you have? Well, yeah, what buckle do you have on? What do you wear on, uh, a, on an everyday va- basis? What's your buckle? Uh, this is going to throw you for a loop because w- what would you think? <clears throat> okay, since you just said that, this is going to throw you for a loop. I'm looking at my guys here. It's some, it's some, not a major rodeo buckle. It's not a gold world all around, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will be like a junior... Uh, a high school district champion buckle. We don't have districts. In Whatever. Texas. Region. <laughs> Can you see that? Holy crap. That is awesome. Yeah. 26. Who did that? Tanner Crow did it. Miles Baker, my partner in the horse business, is who got it made for me. But I love it. It's just perfect size. I mean, show that. Show that again. 
Show, show it that. Doesn't, it doesn't affect my belly as much as those go buckles do. I know. There, that's perfect. Yeah. Wow. I love. It. And that's your brand. Is that your horse brand? That's my brand. I put on the horse's cheeks. Huh. Good choice. I like the little square buckles. I wear my Pendleton buckle sometimes. Yeah, you know, Pendleton's on. Their buckles are awesome. You know, when I was young, I thought, man, there's not, there's just not enough to the Cheyenne buckle. I just didn't get it was such a big rodeo. And now it's like the road buckles are so simple. And then now you can notice one from a football field away. You're like, Hey, wonder what year is that buckle from? You know, you just know, know. it. You know? That's because when you're young, you don't get it. it, it yeah. That's true. I'm serious. Like I remember going, so wait, you in Cheyenne and you get this buckle with horseshoes on it yes. and then wait you win Pendleton and it's just got these three bucking horses I don't get it now you do that's what that's what it is that I mean I can spot them forever and it don't you feel like if you look down because you do it and you see the three bucking horses or those horseshoes there's kind of a cl- it's kind of a club yeah. there it's like well, hey, you know you can talk shop with whoever's over there yeah. there's no they know, you know, and uh, Fort Worth started giving some really cool buckles like the one I'm wearing yeah. uh, towards towards the end there. When that that was really slick, I thought. I'm at a college rodeo or a college football game, Montana State. My mom is an alum and she's got this suite. And my dad and my brother Pete, I don't know if you know my brother Pete, and me, we're all up there. And I'd, I've given, my brother Pete wears one of my NFR buckles. I gave it to him. If it on a good day, you can see it. Not all. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm standing there, and these two guys, I kind of have my back to them, and they're going, "That guy's a real cowboy." Man. They're whispering, "No, look yeah. at him, man. He's got it. That's an NFR buckle. He's got an NFR. NFR." And they keep going up. Who do you think it is? I don't know. They're going back. Finally, I'm like, "I gave him the buckle. That's my buckle. That's my buckle." That's yeah. my buckle. Uh, I'll let you go here pretty soon. I ever tell you. Ty Marie's well, got it. My, oh, go ahead. Go I got to tell you one too. My yeah. mom and dad, you know, I, they can wear any buckle they want of mine. And my mom has my first Pendleton buckle. And my dad wears uh, a big four buckle because of it, it was sized like that. It was just kind of a unique little piece. And that's what he's worn ever since. The big four is the Northwest, right? Oh, yeah. Ellensburg, yeah. Pendleton. Lewiston, Walla Walla? Well, I, Ellensburg's not in it now. It's Kennewick, Lewiston, Walla Walla, and Pendleton. Oh, that's right. They switched that around. El- yeah. Ellensburg's kind of its own thing now. It's, they, they give their own prizes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ty Murray told me, he's sitting in the Salt Lake Airport, and he's got his one of his all-around gold buckles on. This guy looking at him, kind of got a beard. He goes, hey, cowboy. Not, that's a nice buckle you got there. And Ty says, all right, you know, Ty, all right, thanks, Effer. No, he says, uh, he says, hey, man, thanks. He goes, and the guy goes, yeah, I got one just like it at home, but it's got an eagle on it. <laughs> <laughs> it just always, exactly like it. as soon, I always think of that story when I think us in the rodeo Western world start to think we're pretty big. Yeah. And what we're wearing it's- means something. Somebody's got one just like it with an eagle on it. Just like that's it. right. So it's perspective. Yeah, that's right. Listen, um, I told these guys before we went on the air, I said, I miss seeing Trevor. Like I miss seeing a lot of guys, but um I wanted to have you. You were you've been on our whiteboard since day one. So I'm finally I'm glad you finally returned my message. And when you were talking I'm about glad. when I'm you glad we got it worked out. When you were talking about the thing media needs to trust that you'll call them back. Yes. Yeah. Sure, Trevor. Most, 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 of, most it. of the time. I'm retired. I know, that's true. You don't have to live up to it. You don't need to impress anybody anymore. It's like being married. I can go bald now. What the hell? Yeah. Um, but I, I do got to say, I'll say it on the air, that uh, you always return calls as far as being on my stage show. Still to this day, you and Patrick will come on and do goofy crap like always or whatever. But most of all, and my brother Will, who you know, we had a discussion one day uh, about it. You always have treated us as an equal, and we very, we have discussed that we very much appreciate that. You are probably the classiest cowboy I was ever around in my rodeo career, so I appreciate that. 
That's awesome. That means a lot. It really does. Especially since my mom walked in here a while ago. I know really needed her to hear that. Is she is your mom sitting there listening to me? She's just now, yeah. <laughs> she just walked in. She was one of the, the creaky doors you heard. Yeah, well, I could sense somebody was in there that I didn't know. So I thought I'd fill you full of crap one time before yeah, thank I let you, you go. I appreciate it. I still like to impress her. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. Appreciate you. Um, Thanks. Y'all have a great day. Thanks for having uh, me on. Thank you.